So, um, Cam, thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you, James. I, I, I'm really looking forward to asking you some questions about this film. Um, and the first one I want to ask, um, mostly because uh, everyone who just watched the film live just saw the film end this way, is that I was pretty surprised that you had uh, Bruce Springsteen singing over yeah. the, the final <laughs> credits. And my first question for you is, did you have to mortgage the house to get that to, uh, you know, to license the song to get that, to get it in the film? That's a great question. <laughs> There's a lot to that, uh, as you can imagine. Um, uh, you know, I knew from, from experiences uh, in festivals that when, when we do a film, um, we, you know, we try to reduce it to the, uh, smallest number of minutes possible, and we leave some really good things out of the film. Um, uh, and knowing that a feature film for festivals, you know, you really need to be under 90 minutes and be good to get 80, 84, 85 minutes. Um, and, but the, the end credits can take three to six minutes. Mm. And, and I know that everybody just tunes out on the end credits, and I'm thinking, boy, that's valuable real estate, right? <laughs> and so how can we do it? So I thought for this film, we would have a good song, uh, an appropriate song, a, a song consistent with the theme of the film, um, uh, and have our own little story that goes through the end of that um, to try to keep people engaged for the whole time. Uh, and uh, I love Springsteen, um, been to five of his concerts, and I knew this song very well. Uh, he uh, started he wrote it and they started playing with the East Street Band when they got back together. Um, and they played it live and never actually did it in a studio recording, um, just on the live albums, uh, until after the band uh, broke up again and Clarence Clemens passed away, mm -hmm. uh, but then they recorded it. So I went to a music attorney and I said, uh, I'd really like to get this song and I've, I've edited uh, the end credits for it, and you know, what do you think? And she goes, well, No, you'll never be able to afford a Springsteen song. Mm -hmm. so, you know, I, got, I kind of have a feeling about this. I grew up in New Jersey, he's from New Jersey, oh. and I was a you know, he grew up in Catholic, Catholic Church. Uh, he's a big humanitarian. Let me write some stuff up and you know, send this. And um, <clears throat> she uh, called me uh, uh, about a month later and said, uh, you know, don't get your hopes up because I really think there's a typo in here um, on, the, uh, on the number. And it turned out uh, they cut us a really good deal, which we yeah, so, but, so Right, so to get that good deal, you have to, you're not just licensing from the record company, you need to run it by him to get him to say, to authorize a good deal, right? So he, he knows about the film and, he, and, and it, he did realize that it was up his alley. Yeah, yeah, I, I assume that. That was a case and that's I, I wrote about three pages in a cover um, uh, just explaining it and sort of hitting the highlights why I thought he would appreciate the film. Um, so, so yeah, it worked out really well. We're very happy with that. And just to finish that up, to when, but when you say a typo, you mean one less zero than she thought there was going to be, right? Yeah, a, a couple less zeros. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, good yeah. for you guys. Um, so I see the posters behind you. I also see your uh, furry friends behind you, um, which maybe you can explain. But um, let's talk about the connection between your first film, Madagascara, and the current one. Okay. So <clears throat> why don't you just, first of all, explain the first film uh, to those who haven't seen it. Yeah, Ma Madagascara, which is available on iTunes and Amazon Prime now, in case people are interested, um, as well as Voodoo and Tubi TV. Uh, yeah. Is I started that film because I had heard in a human rights study clinic um, about Madagascar, and I knew nothing about Madagascar, and it, it, it shocked me that I knew nothing about Madagascar. And like, how could that be? How could this be the poorest country in the world? Population at that time, 23 million people, half the population children, half the, pop half of the children grossly malnourished. How mm. did I not know about that? How do we not know about that? Um, so I did a lot of research and realized that, that part of the big issue is, um, you know, it's in another hemisphere. 
uh, we think of Haiti when we think of the poorest countries, you know, in the world and Haiti's poor, but not on a scale like this. Hmm. Um, and they have their own nat natural disasters. It's almost biblical what happens uh, out there uh, to those people. Um, uh, and uh, so I did that and it's really, uh, what I found is that the, uh, a lot, gr a great part of the problem is domestic politics um, for sure, but also international politics. And I wanted to focus on that. I have a history in, in law and economics and, and really that appealed to me. And, and I dug into it and got some great documentation and, and understanding, got some great experts. And, and so we went there, but we follow three women uh, over about three and a half years uh, and their families there while making a uh, so, so social political um, essay. Uh, about it, but it's very hard hitting because Madagascar is a really tough place. Um, in the course of filming that, uh, I was uh, told about uh, Pedro Opeka, and uh, I I was uh, looking down in a quarry. We were trying to film in a quarry, which is a centerpiece of uh, Madagascar, and um, this woman walked up uh, the the side of the quarry with a, a bucket of uh, rocks, cut rocks on her head and the baby on her back. And we asked her, um, you know, where people lived because I was looking for someone in particular. Um, and we couldn't get down into the quarry without permission. And she said, well, some of us live over here and some of us live up there. And I looked up there and along this hillside and people who have seen the movie now know are all these two story white buildings. And, and actually I was stunned at, I thought, is that a military complex? Mm. You know, what is that? Cause there's nothing like it in all of Madagascar. Uh, and she said, that's uh, Akamaso. I said, what's Akamaso? She said, that's Father Pedro. Like, you know, where are you from? How could you not know Father Pedro? Um, and once I learned more about him, um, uh, I asked to meet him the first time, uh, I, I went to meet him, it was a few months later when I came back to Madagascar. Um, he had just come from a fundraising effort in Europe and, and uh, was exhausted. And, and he's weary of, of Westerners trying to use him for their own purposes. Um, so he was sort of stern with me, uh, w willing to meet, but stern and wanted to hear what I had to say. And when I told him about Madagascar and why I was doing it and why I felt uh, my own country was complicit in, in some of the problems there. Um, you know, he just said, how can I help? You know, what do you need? And uh, he was actually became an expert there. The more I got to know him, the more I learned about his story. I just felt that uh, this is a really um, important story to convey, particularly to the Western world. He's somewhat uh, known, not well known, I'd say, uh, in uh, Europe and Western Europe, but but uh, uh, really not known at all in the U.S. He's been nominated several times for a Nobel Peace Prize, uh, nominated again this year, uh, and I think they make decisions next month, so we'll see what happens. So that pretty much answers our first audience question, which is from Robert, which is how did how did you learn about uh, Father Opeka? This remark he says this remarkable priest, which obviously he clearly is. Um, my next question for you has to do with the um, si the political situation in Madagascar, and you in this film in Opeka, you kind of allude to it, especially at the beginning, um, but then you kind of don't go back to it. And I have a feeling that's because you feel like, well, I took care of that. You know, I kind of addressed the real um, ugly side of the situation in the first film, and you did in you know in the way that the you know, the, uh, the, this one, the new one uh, ends with the Springsteen song, Land of Hope and Dreams. You wanted it to be a more positive experience watching this one. Is that true? They, rather than yeah, sort of they, dwelling they, again they, on the, on the uh, um, corrupt situation in the government? Yeah, yeah, no, the, the, um, right. Uh, the, the first film uh, not only deals with sort of the domestic political problems. It, it, it also focuses on um, sort of international uh, uh, reactions uh, uh, to Madagascar and part of the issues there. Um, it was, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a duology of sorts. And, and I didn't mean 
for one to be a prequel and one to be a sequel. It's not mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. You don't need to see one to, to right. see the other. It's a duology. They're related, but separate. Um, and, and, you know, the way I shorthand it is the first film was about survival and the second film was about hope. I, I put in the introduction to this film that way because so much of who he is, is um, he's a fighter and, and he, he does speak truth to power uh, and he's very forceful about it. Um, and in fact, in the two hour version of the film, there's more of a political um, treatment by him. But, but yes, I, I did feel that much of that was handled in the first film, but, but that was also secondary in many ways to what I wanted to communicate in this film. And uh, so uh, uh, speaking truth to power, being an advocate for the poor uh, in his adopted country, um, uh, reacting and, and acting in ways that that the leaders should act in but do not uh, and demonstrating to them this can be done this is all you have to do and he keeps saying it to them why aren't you doing this why aren't you doing this <clears throat> corruption is a big part of it uh, sort of the, the political institutional um, uh, ossification is part of it but um, uh, we didn't. We, we decided not to do much more of a treatment of his uh, political, his efforts in the political uh, sphere in Madagascar, and, and really lead it to leave it to his his uh, caring for the poor. Right. So uh, the next thing I'm curious about is um, he's such an impressive figure. Does this guy have any faults? Yeah. Well, you know, he, he does, for sure. Um, uh, and he, he will admit to them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he, um, uh, he, he can, you know, he, he will never do it in front of people, but I've, I've you know, I became close with him, uh, but I've seen him. He can get angry mm -hmm. and, and he'll regret being angry. Now that's, that's human. And, and one of the things, this is important because one of the things that I tried to do in the film was not present him as a superhero doing an ordinary superhero thing, but as a, as a real human being doing something extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, but he is, he is human. He's, he's, um, he gets tired, you know, like everybody else. Yep. And, it and certainly doesn't seem like it. And, and <laughs> that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, we look for those moments. Um, there's that one scene in the film where he does get angry, right, at that couple, uh, the yeah. night watchman and, and his wife. Right. Um, and uh, there was more to that. But it, so, so, you know, that's where he lets loose that, that forcefulness. Um, but he does try to keep it in, in check as much as possible. Um, there's that... Uh, uh, <clears throat> He's a remarkable man. He's just, just an extraordinary human being, I must say. Clearly. Um, so now here's something that I'm sure both you and he have, have you know, kind of dealt with or heard from people. It kind of plays off of the last question I just asked. He, he is kind of the epitome, basically, of the idea of a white savior, right? He's the white guy yeah. who went in yeah. and helped out thousands of people of color, who couldn't help themselves or so it would appear right and so i'm curious about a how he feels about that and b how you as the filmmaker feel about that yeah i knew that was an issue uh uh you know when we did madagascara um uh i was actually personally criticized in in some quarters for um you know, what are, what are you, a white filmmaker going out and trying to, you know, reveal what's going on in an African country and mm -hmm. all that. No, I was, I was sensitive to that. Um, there is, there is, what I tried to do is be authentic about everything. And this is an authentic story. This is a real story. If someone wants to characterize him as a white savior, I, there's nothing I can do about it. It is what mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. Um, I really felt that it was a story that, that had to be told um uh were were he black or of color would been able to do this? yes um because the distinguishing 
characteristics are um, his passion, his intellect, his his you know, life force, um, and his his mission uh, for justice. Um, and uh, you know, he's he's Argentine of Slovenian parents uh, who suffered quite a bit, and his his life was not easy. But he chose right having the option to become a professional football player or committing his life to to be a missionary he chose that um and uh, and there it is and and yeah he may be characterized as as uh, a white savior i didn't think about that nor nor i, I mean I, I i didn't labor with that because this story is what it is he is who he is but the other thing is uh, what i did feel and thought about a lot um, because this is my impression of him, that he's a humanitarian first and a priest second. Mm. And uh, mm -hmm. I wanted that to come out in the film. Of course, he's a priest. Uh, he's a um, rebel priest, as I, as I think you'll see. Uh, I think you saw in the film. But um, uh, he's a humanitarian first and foremost. And I, I, I believe he would characterize himself uh, that way as well. Uh, best kind of priests, the rebel priests. Yeah, the uh, rebel priests. Is, um, so I would assume this is true as it is across much of the globe, but is soccer the net basically the, the closest thing to a national game in Madagascar? Rugby as oh, well. Oh, but, but also... Yeah, rugby, rugby, rugby and soccer. And in fact, last year, surprisingly, Madagascar um, did extremely well. Their national team did extremely well in the, uh, in the African Cup. Um, so it was a big source of pride for them. But yes, uh, soccer and rugby are, the, are their two big sports. So we have a couple of more uh, uh, audience questions. Uh, Gene from Rally, this is an interesting one. Gene from Rally wants to know what you think uh, w about how Disney represented Madagascar in their animated film and whether they misrepresented it by downplaying, you know, with the social issues that clearly you've seen. Thank you, Gene. Absolutely. <laughs> this, is one of the, this is one of the things that, that bothered me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Gene. Um, it bothered me in the beginning as well as, so not just the animated films. And, and, and I felt guilty, as I said, I knew nothing about Madagascar. And part of it was we get, I think we got, we've been acculturated to um, sort of a, a cold place uh, because of the animated films. Everyone over the age of five or six knows the word Madagascar <laughs> only because of the animated films, mm -hmm. um, but we, we don't really know much that's real about Madagascar other than uh, the environmentalists who, this is a lemur, and I love lemurs. Uh, they are um, uh, simians and they're extraordinary creatures um, uh, in Madagascar. and. Uh, and, you know, they, many of their species are going extinct and the environmentalists are concerned about that and they're concerned about the loss of the rainforest in Madagascar. But they, these amazing creatures will go extinct, the rainforest will go away if poverty isn't solved there. And there's no discussion uh, uh, about poverty. So yes, I, I do think Disney has, should think about um, dealing, addressing this in, in some way. Uh, it's great. The films are great. Uh, that's not their mission, but um, they're in a position to actually bring some light to what's going on more than, than I am. Um, but the other, the other thing is, uh, um, uh, you know, the poverty is too thorny an issue for, to discuss. Um, so they just, and, and the people trying to save lemurs. In fact, I got this at the Oakland Zoo because mm -hmm. they invited me to show Madagascar. And I oh, said, wow. no, you know, you want to say, no, we, 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 we get it. We, we get it. We know they can't be saved if, uh, if poverty isn't solved. So we want to bring more, more light on that. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think both Disney and um, yeah, the environmentalists, whom I'm trying to uh, coordinate with, uh, really need to um, get the extreme poverty out a little bit more. Thanks for that question, great.
Yeah, and we're actually getting a little flurry of audience questions, so I'm going to rattle them off to you. Um, so Catherine would like to know, would, uh, would, you, would you be uh, able to speak about uh, any support um, that might have come from St. Vincent de Paul and whether there has been any resistance on their part to, uh, or for, on the state's part rather, to uh, uh, what Father Pedro has, has done in Madagascar? So I guess that's a two-part two question. Uh, um yeah, uh, the, the uh, St. Vincent de Paul, the Vincentians, uh, know Father Pedro, they support Father Pedro. Um, we didn't get any support from them. Ours yeah. was uh, totally, and so again, I, I try to, I view him more as a humanitarian, and I'm not a particularly, um, uh, I'm not Catholic, I'm not a particularly religious person. Um, uh, and I didn't want any sort of outside influence like that, even if they, they did offer. But the Vincentians um, uh, have a great deal of respect for him and, and allow him to do this. It's not with money, but it's, it's just allowing his time uh, to do it um, because he is part of the Vincentians. Mm -hmm. um, great question about the state of Madagascar. They mm -hmm. are, um, it's, it's a difficult he has with them because he provides services that they do not, that they can't housing, healthcare, sanitation, um, access to walks, to food, jobs. Um, that's a government's function. Uh, and he just raises the money privately and dedicates the money that way. The government gets billions of dollars uh, through financial aid and, and through uh, auctioning off uh, right. its valuable sources, um, and yet uh, doesn't doesn't do anything. So, um, someone from the U.S. Embassy um, in Madagascar actually approached me and said, "Do, do you think he's safe?" Um, and uh, I think he is because he's just so well known. Um, uh, you know, that's that's connection there. But yes, the government is. Um, uh, is wary of him showing them up. In, in fact, uh, whenever housing crisis came to help out, like overflow housing and, and things like that. And obviously you, you saw the educational system where um, they have they, their schools, uh, students in their schools do better than uh, students outside of Akamaso. And, and so it is, it is an issue. Um, we're all sensitive about it. Sensitive about it, not in terms of physical safety, as you could imagine, um, uh, but, but in terms of the, the safety, the image of Akamaso. So uh, there can be press that's initiated by the government or statements by government officials, and he very quick to respond to that uh, in, in the press uh, and, and get in front of those things so that um, if there is an effort to diminish so uh, he's addressing that. Mm -hmm. um, I think I have personally have one more question for you um, about the situation there. And maybe since you finished filming, I'm just curious whether how hard uh, COVID has hit Madagascar, if at all. Uh, yeah, another great question. Um, uh, early going, because Mad Madagascar is an island, and so um, right. they could close things down. Um, uh, um, you know, the, the extent of the poverty is, is such that um, uh, the, the work sites and, and things like that are mostly out in the air. <laughs> um, you know, that. But what happened was their, their new young president, um, uh, uh, believed in, in a uh, herbal cure um, that was being developed in Madagascar, and he promoted it. And right. And so in the early months of the pandemic, Madagascar was doing really good. Again, people are dispersed, mostly working outside, following rules. Um, uh, but then people started believing in this, this cure and things have gotten much worse. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so things are getting worse there now, uh, because of Father Pedro, um, 
uh, everybody's doing really well. Um, you know, they're, they're on message about what to do. Um, uh, when he holds meetings, everybody's distant. Hmm. Um, when he holds his masses, he'll, he'll drive around in a car so people can be outside, you know, and, and doing those kinds of things. So they're, they're, doing, uh, they're doing well at Alchemist Show, but not so well in the country right now. Uh, maybe, yeah, uh, that, that kind of leads to another thing that I just I, I hadn't occurred to me to ask until now. You were, you know, you talked earlier, and I'm not surprised to hear that he was pretty reluctant at first to be, you know, sort of the, 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 the namesake of the title of the movie, the guy who is presented as the savior. Um, was there any particular resistance on his part to filming the church scenes, I'm wondering? Because that seems so personal to their community. Um, or by that point, had you already filmed enough of all the work that he'd done in, in the whole community that it wasn't an issue? <clears throat> yeah, the, the, church, the church scenes in particular, no, there was no, um, we, we, I, I went to 10 masses, um, uh, you know, over the course of, of three years and uh, um, I filmed during most of them. Um, so we had a lot of footage, but again, his masses, because it's, it's too easy to mischaracterize what's going on with religion there. It's not a religious community. It's an NGO. And, and he's a Catholic, so he'll have masses on Sunday, but those are open to everybody, not just people from Akamaso, but from around the region. They all come in of all faiths or no faith. Mm. You know, just come on in and participate culturally in this event um and i didn't i didn't want too much of it misunderstood so all, all of the church scenes in what i'd call the rebel priest segment right during the hallelujah um uh, right. song um to to show the background of those scenes which are remarkable i mean thousands and thousands of people attend mm -hmm. uh every sunday uh but but to get out this is uh, you know, fire and brimstone and, and that kind of thing. Uh, his, his message is what his message is when, when in the cathedral court, um, uh, that scene where he talks about what he's doing, it's not to convert people uh, to Catholicism, it's just a message, um, a human message, he says, that is him. And, and that, that's what he does. He didn't resist at all uh, in the filming of church scenes. If anything, I, I wanted to, um, use them selectively. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, everyone welcome, essentially, right? <clears throat> welcome. Uh, and in Akuma so too, again, it's not, it's not a religious community at all. Yeah. Um, so you were talking about the crew filming in, in those sequences. And uh, one of our viewers named Barbara kind of is asking about that. She just wants to know, how big was your crew essentially? She's saying it looked like everybody, uh, uh, it looked like you felt you did everything yourself, but clearly you didn't, you had a crew, right? Had a crew. Um, I, I first went for the first film. I went over there by myself, just with my equipment, um, not knowing what to do and uh, not knowing if I would be able to find people. Um, I didn't take anybody from the U.S. And uh, I found uh, a translator who turned into the fixer, who turned into the assistant director, uh, who's mentioned credits. Um, uh, and with him, I found some people who were really great at photography. Uh, and so worked with them. Uh, and then uh, over the course of a couple of years, really developed a great relationship with uh, one guy in particular, a Malagasy um, cameraman, Natanena, who was just remarkable, and a sound man uh, who was also great. And so I made sure I had them uh, on almost everything um, that, that we did. Hmm. So they were good. Um, but uh, it was bare bones, and and uh, we did we did most of it um, all of ourselves. And I had a great editor in Tiffany. Uh, 
you know, who ended up being the co-producer as well of, of both films because she was such a great collaborator uh, and partner on the films. Good. Um, I think I'm going to, we, we could, we could continue, but I think we're going to wrap it up um, uh, because I want to quote one more. It's not really a, it's not really a question. It's more of a comment, um, which is, uh, you know, we hear that a lot in Q and A's, but this is well worth uh, ending on. Um, uh, Allison, uh, our viewer, Allison uh, Rugg says, um, what an inspiring film. It's now on my list of favorite documentaries. So I kind of feel like that's a good point oh, wow. to, uh, to wrap things up in. Um, and yeah. I am tending to agree with Allison. We were really happy to have you here, Cam, and, uh, uh, you know, glad to spend a half an hour with you and uh, look forward to having more folks watch the film through the course of the week. And uh, for those of you who want to tell friends and family, they can watch this Q&A at any point after the festival is over as well. Um, so uh, best of luck with the film. Um, continuing to roll it out in these uncertain times, uh, not in person times. And, um, you know, we look forward to seeing what you come up with next. Thank you, James. And, and thank you, Allison, for that comment. It was a great place to end. Um, and well, well done to James, Joanne, and, and the whole team at the uh, festival. Great, well, great to have you.